Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, this is it. We're live. Hey, Varun, what is going on? How are you? Awesome day. Awesome day. So we are here today to chat with our today's guest. Let me start off with this wonderful introduction. Ready? So uh, today's guest is a business entrepreneur, a photographer. He specializes in mobile development strategies, web development strategies, graphic design, ISD training methodologies, and interface design. He's the co-founder and CEO of Mobilux, Garrett Ross. Welcome to the podcast, Garrett. Glad to be here. I think this is a, I'm glad you guys are doing this. It makes it feel like we all can learn from each other's mistakes and successes. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. That's the whole, you just, that's it. There it is. Done. Okay, done. <laughs> Everyone have a wonderful day. <laughs> Perfect. So, all right. So the first question that we've been doing in season two so far is this myth smashing, which has been really a, f- a fun conversation if anyone's listening and has listened to other episodes. If this is your first, we're going to ask Garrett to give us a myth that he'd like to smash, some sort of bogus strategy, misconception that he wants to set the record straight on. What is it that you'd like to clear up? What do you got cooking that you want to just <laughs> smash? Well, well, I may get in a little bit of trouble with this even with my own, my own company, but Number one is uh, talent is overrated. Oh, you're going to have to expand on that a little bit. I'll expand on that. And then the other one that's close to that is process is overrated. Gotcha. I think those are two, two good things that kind of go hand in hand, but, but I'll, uh, I'll go in a little more detail on that. All right. Well, please go into detail on that. (laughs) So are you guys familiar with, uh let's make sure it's Anders Ericsson. I know the name, but I don't yeah. know. So he wrote a book called Peak, and he really gets into defunking talent because a lot of people we believe this person was born a great shooter in sports, this person was born someone with a great eye for design, this person was just a natural. And he goes into a pretty good depth into explaining why that is a bunch of bogus. And for me, when we're like trying to find people who we want to work with, who I don't want to be a part of our company, like I will take somebody who has already proven the ability to, to execute, to do something well, as well as a proven routine that they can actually keep improving, right? So work ethic, deliberate focus, deliberate practice, how they really mature themselves uh, is more important to me in the long run than someone who I perceive as, but well, he's as talented or she's as talented. She's got a good eye. Cause I think anything can really be learned. And if you really work hard enough and <clears throat> have a good enough work ethic, you know, <clears throat> how you break things down, how you go after stuff, you'll actually become really, really good at your craft, whatever that craft may be. I mean, maybe what you're saying is, is as someone who never took statistics or physics in school, because they just don't think like that, if I try hard enough, then I could probably be a statistician. (laughs) Maybe not, you know, so, but you know, that's what I'm hearing coming from you, which is an interesting, it's kind of an interesting concept because a lot of times we give people an excuse. Oh, they're talented. They can avoid process. Oh, they're talented. We don't want to lose them. So it's an interesting it's an interesting point there. Well, I'm a bit of a basketball nut. And, and one of the guys who I grew up loved watching was Ray Allen, right? Ray mm-hmm. Allen was a shooter. He was on the Celtics. He's on all the different teams known as the three point King before Steph Curry. Right. Yep. And what used to drive him crazy was when somebody would go, Oh, you're just so natural. He's like, no, I'm not. I spent so many hours in the gym doing the exact routines, doing the exact same things so that I could appear effortless, but it wasn't just like, natural i wasn't born with this and so i I think a lot of this comes back to well then you go to well how do i really get good so you're saying statistics right that's intimidating right you may sit there go i've never been good with numbers how could i actually get good at statistics and then you have to get really good and this is where anders erickson did a really good job what makes great learning 
and he has this concept of deliberate practice, but it's honestly like if you go through, or we've been through the year of pandemic, right? I'd be willing to wager that as a business, especially running a business, you learned more in the last 12 months and how to optimize your business than you did probably the last three years combined, right? Well, why is that? It wasn't like there was a process gearing up for the pandemic. It wasn't like something else that like geared you for it. You ultimately had to get into chaos, enjoy the, not necessarily enjoy it, but go through the feeling of being discomfortable and learn from it. And so when you really get good at something, a lot of it comes back to how well do you appreciate feeling uncomfortable and if you can appreciate feeling uncomfortable that's when you're going to learn the most and be able to do some of the most amazing work and so i think as a company we've done that over the years just kind of jumped in and not knowing what to do or how to do it and feeling like they, i mean there is no process there is no like book to give you instructions on how to do it but is there like a personality trait that you feel like those of us are born with it maybe she, you know, like Maybelline, maybe she's born with it. Maybe, you know, that's horrible, horrible joke. Um, but the idea of having, you know, those who people, some people are averse to feeling uncomfortable. Some people, they run in the absolute opposite direction. You know, you said the other myth you wanted to smash was process. process. Anti, you know, so, so it goes, it goes hand in hand, right? Cause yeah. a lot of times, so it's funny cause my business partner, I have a co-founder, Jeff Rock. We started this together, right? We worked for probably a decade before doing this and at our old companies we worked for, we'd literally jump in and I'd be like, okay, I want to plan it all out. And I'd sit there and I'd talk to all the people, I'd plan everything, I'd turn around and then he'd be done. Right. And it was just the ability for him to jump in and solve problems and get, get things, just get stuff done, get it, get it knocked out. And he was one of those guys that was a 3D modeler, a videographer, a narrator, a coder, like he could just find a problem and solve it. So I think some of it is people are afraid to fail. And we come through this educational system of you're going to get a bad grade. You're not going to be able to get to the next, next, you know, level up and whatever that is. Mm. And so we are taught to be afraid. And so I think it's, you can, un, you can learn, just like we're talking about this, you know, it's not, not that you're born with this is that you can learn to feel uncomfortable. And it's funny over the years, I can't tell you how many times we've rewritten a process. Mm-hmm. Someone new comes in, we only had a process that would work a little bit better things would be smoother. And I, and I just say, okay, define the process and go, because usually during that process of it, they're solving new problems that are new and unique. And we're in the mindset of custom software. Like custom means new and unique almost every single time. If we were doing cookie cutter websites, every single thing, like then a process really works, you know, put it on the conveyor belt and ship it out. But when you're solving unique problems, you almost like, have to understand that there isn't a, an existing process that will solve that for you. You still have to solve the hard problem. You still have to feel uncomfortable. You still have to dig into it. So to me, it kind of goes a little bit hand in hand. Like I think we're happiest as a human race when we can look back and see what we accomplished. When we do meaningful work for somebody for ourselves, we see the growth, but usually in that moment, you're not really happy you're not thrilled to be like sweating it out, trying to solve a problem and feeling uncomfortable, but everything in life, life that's really worthwhile, you know, having a kid, raising a family, those like things that are really hard. You look back and you go, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. And so, so I think that's where like, as a business, you know, talent is low. I don't want the guy to come in there and draw me a pretty picture. I wanted to come in and s- struggle with that person next to me, trying to solve a hard problem and then be proud together that, Hey, we shipped this, you know, we did this. So um, I want to come back to the process, but before that, um, the talent is overrated. I, I so much agree with that. That reminds me of that book by Malcolm Gladwell, I think yep. Outliers, yep. Ten, the, the rule of 10,000 uh, times that it takes you to master something. Anyone can become a master of talent. That, that's a myth too. Right. It's not that the 10,000 hours is right because it's different per discipline. Right. Yeah. I could maybe learn how to become a good guitar player with 600 hours. Yeah. It might take 20,000 hours to become an expert pianist. But, but the idea right? of doing practice, like get yes. better and learn and anyone can learn anything. That idea so much resonates with me. And I think in our industry, um, in software, because I'm thinking from, um, 
you know, um, our, our industry's perspective, like people who are running companies like ours, um, agencies and software companies, they, they look at talent all the time, right? I mean, and when, how do you use that mindset to, to hire, to build a team, to train, to, to um, you know, uh, make sure that, you know, you have the best people. Yeah. How do you utilize that mindset to build that? I think that is what, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, I would love to hear, like, how do you approach uh, acquisition or, or talent acquisition when you know that, you know, uh, anyone that we train is hire, is anyone that we hire is trainable, you know? Yeah. Well, it's hard because we don't train a lot of people on the job, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's uh, honestly, the, one of the biggest traits we look for when we've hired people is, all right, what have you made? You know, what are the, the code skeletons in your closet? You know, what are the things you never shipped? I don't want to see the tutorial you did. I don't want to see the fi finished polished piece, polished piece. I can't even see what you were actually did of it. Yeah. I want to actually see what you do on your own. Yeah. Prove to me you have a passion. Prove to me that you're succeeding in, in your skill set and, and becoming better at your passion. And then I get excited. And I, I think that's kind of like we did it by, I don't want to say by accident, but but in the very beginning of the company, every employee you hire is like critical, right? So it was, well, designers. Well, I'm not, I had this, I had this rule. We're not going to hire a designer unless they write code. And just because I thought that the cohesiveness of a designer that could understand, so even a bare minimum of code writing would work better with a developer. Uh, we changed that over years, but that was one of those like early things to kind of test of, well, what's the filter for hiring somebody? And Did it work? Hiring a designer who can code? I think it worked really well in the beginning. And then we ran into a guy who ended up becoming our, our creative director for seven years. He didn't write code. He wrote a little bit, but he was so talented. There's that word. He was so, he had so much work that he produced from illustration work to how he thought and solved critical problems to how, what he was able to produce at such a mass level that it was like, all right, well, what's really the skill we're looking at? And then we, we kind of fallen in this rhythm now with designers where we actually love the ability to illustrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that becomes such a key piece because we write, we do so much custom iconography, so much mm -hmm. custom design work. And, and in our industry, how do you stand unique from somebody else? Mm -hmm. It's not that you can utilize an existing library. It's that you can create your own visual content, whether it's illustration, iconography, typography in some cases, or photography. And so I think those elements, that kind of a mindset became more of the path we ended up going. Um, do you feel like an Apple switch? So do you feel like with that kind of hire, you know, let's let's talk about this for another minute because I think it's important because you're okay. mixing. Well, it's interesting because you're mixing somebody who has the creative ability to create, and you're saying you know, and I'd be curious to hear if you hire, you know, designers who can't code, but do they understand what's capable within the code? Like, are you, are you putting parameters around it and vice versa coders who need design, yeah. but parameters around what they envision from, you know, there's a, I think there's a, I, I don't know how to verbally describe the knitting that needs to happen between. Well, there's, there's two worlds. knittings, right. And, and yeah. this is where I think like a lot of agencies who are design agencies only have a hard time in the handoff, mm -hmm. right? And because there's a little bit of a language, there's a little bit of not necessarily even a language and understanding of what that person can actually code and develop, right? And there's that healthy friction that has to happen of that pushback and the nuance and the changes between design and development. So totally. part of it is experience, but part of it is also like how well does that designer understand real concepts of friction right because to it to, to us we really hone in on great ui great design is the ability re to reduce friction in whatever way that might be so it might be in your form might be in a simple way of a funnel and, and improving your flow right for your site how do you do that so now it's i think we look for can they use the tools we like to use so with figma out now and all these different tool sets that are out there it changes. So I, we don't look as a, like, I don't work as a company now and go, I have to, I only hire designers that code because that's not true. But now we want to show us what you've proven through your work, show us that you can work in a way that we like to work, right? So we, we have culture fit. Yep. And then um, 
where do you really want to grow and expand? And, and, and so our designers I do brand work. They'll do custom illustration, iconography, but more importantly, they'll do really good UI work. So I want to come back to that, but before that, I think this, this statement is so strong. I mean, I, I think I totally agree with that thought and it reminds me of change in the process and mindset that we did in our company when you said that, you know, keeping designer or, or hiring designer with just the design skills without dev uh, knowledge and having a developer without good user experience or good design, uh, you know, a framework in mind is, is difficult they, because when that handoff happens, it is not very seamless. So if you have a dev team who understands the basic concepts of what's a good design look like, so they will be developing from that mindset. They will be developing from the, from, from the you know, uh, by thinking end user in, the mi in mind as well, because they are trying to produce a good user experience. Same with the designer. Designers, if they know that developers or, or this is how coder is going to code, they will design such thing in a way that can resonate with them. So that synergy has to have, it has to be there. And yeah. that can, that, 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 that team and conglomeration of both those players could be so, so strong. Yeah. So um, this makes total sense. It's funny because I, a few years back, I read one of, like Seth Godin's one of those inspiration points, right? That I think a lot of us business people have. And he talks about being an artist. And, and for me, our greatest artists are actually our developers, yeah. right? They're the ones that have to solve the tough problems. They're the ones that have to kind of figure out how to connect the dots. And so there's a mindset, I think, in a lot of development that's out there, right? Where does it functionally work or... Does this work in the way that that makes like, like delight in moments of of you know happiness, right? And, and there's a there's a patience and mindset that a developer has to have to deal with that feedback cycle, right? And, and so I th I think that's been one of those challenges, and I, and I think it's changing. I think it used to be a little bit one of those like kind of slights against outsourcing was that well they're more functional development and it's hard versus a US developer they can speak your language like literally but i think that's it's all evolving and changing and i think you have a culture now of of what people expect from software is different mm -hmm. and that's driving that change across the whole kind of you know market there's a dependency there that we haven't ever experienced i mean we carry around computers in our pockets. It's so, so meta right now. I want to, you know, we've talked, we jumped right in here. I want to go back and just ask you, you know, you know, as an agency owner, you know, we, we started talking about people, which is one of our favorite topics in this podcast is, you know, culture and people and how to kind of get there. And your myth led straight into it. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, as an agency owner, what's the most fun thing for you? You know, you started, um, you know, your, your intro story in terms of how you got into this is, is kind of fun between your business partner and your passion for photography. And, you know, out of all the, out of all you've done, what's, what's, you know, tell us a little bit about that. What's that, what's that most fun thing that you're like, that gets you up in the morning? Like, yes, I get to do this. <laughs> it's funny. And this might sound kind of weird and maybe a little demented. I actually like that last 10% of getting something over the fence, That that, you know, when things are, feel like they're done, but they're not really done. Yeah. Then it takes a while and people stress out and they feel this, you can feel it from each other and you can feel it from the team. You feel it from the client. I love the process of going through that and shipping something that you're proud of. Right. And so um, I, being able to ship stuff, being able to, to ship something that you're proud of. And I think that goes back to like our early DNA, but that's, that's what gets me up. I, I'm getting, smart people who are driven who want to build things that people use and seeing how i can be a piece in that whether it's connecting them whether it's actually being in the work whether it's something else and together it comes and you have something tangible that brings like value and i think that's what gets me up seeing how you can change people through actually building stuff and and we get caught in that it's technology and writing code but it's it's humans working together solving challenging problems and, and that is hard I mean, people forget that that's hard and, I, and so for me it's a success every time you get through it um our you brought up like our origin story we didn't start, set out to be a, a agency you know our goal was to be our own products company 
and we couldn't even con like convince a developer to join with us back in on day one so my business partner and i were like well what do we do and this is we started right when the phone came out so everything was a possibility you know tickets and events and and you know sparse code scanning all those things were ideas that we were all part of that circle but because we couldn't get a developer my business partner was like well i like tumblr i've written stuff for tumblr you know changing my website i'm familiar with their api that they're trying to do i think i can make an app and it'll be our first step in making a product and so he literally at nights on a wooden chair and a wooden desk and feeling uncomfortable for two months with, again, people forget that first two months of stuff, six months of developing, there weren't, there weren't any books. Apple just said, here you go. <laughs> and you had to figure it out. And so it, it truly was that, that uh, tough, awkward, frustrated learning. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, Jeff, bless his soul, was able to figure things out. And we launched an app to let you post to Tumblr and, Tumblr bought it from us, acquired it from us. We became Tumblr's mobile development team and Tumblr essentially turned us into a services company. But we were, hey, we want to build stuff for ourselves. And that was kind of like our DNA. And I think early on, everyone who joined us was, yeah, we want to build stuff for ourselves. Oh, I guess we'll do it for this person. Well, that's a cool project. I guess we'll do it for that person. So it was a little bit of a mix. And we lived in that hybrid world for a long time of we're going to make stuff for ourselves and for these people. That's, that's a great story. I mean, I think this is um, a unique in itself. Like many agencies think about going from service to product. Many are building their own products because, you know, they have been in service for some time while you switched the other way, right? You were product person then turned into a service. So I would like to hear, hear more about that shift, like why that happened and what would you advise somebody who is thinking about going into product and not going into service back again, then, you know, they are in service, go to product and then start thinking about, you know, yeah. services more, make more sense. Um, well, there's a couple of things we've learned, you know, good and bad throughout that, that process. But I think it goes back to the beginning where I, f I feel like if you, you talk about that deliberate practice, right? I feel like if you want to get good at something, this is something I've always done for myself is you do it for somebody else. You know, like photography, I didn't take any photography classes. You know, I got a design degree, but it wasn't photography. And I, I decided to get good at photography when I decided to shoot my business partner's wedding, right? And then doing someone else's. And for me, it was then, all right, well, if I have to stress out doing it for somebody else, I'm going to get better at that craft. So for as a company, um, services was one of those things of, well, we don't want to go raise money, right? People, a lot of people start a products company. And the first thing you got to do is go get capital. Cause you got to live for a while. And for us, it was, you know, we were too naive about it. We didn't have a network to go ask for people. We had nowhere, we didn't know where to start. So it was literally, well, we got to feed our families. Let's take this job. And then it became a little bit of a challenge of, well, if we get that job for a hundred thousand dollars, could we get another job for another hundred? Like, can we make this work? Like it became one of those things to like, Hey, let's just, let's at least break even with building our team. And then let's build stuff on the side. And we built, Quite a few different products. There's one company we built, our product we built is called the Carousel. It was a desktop viewer that lets you uh, view your uh, Instagram feed from, the, from, from a Mac. Um, it, we learned about trademarks. You know, we actually trademarked it and we defended it against Adobe. <laughs> like, so you had like these weird pieces that, that would come through doing product work. So I think for us, I mean, it wasn't until probably maybe about three years ago, we decided to stop doing our own products. Um, and really make MobileX as a services company our primary product. And, but it, it took a little bit of learning and figuring that out. And, and, and I think where we did well is we built some really good products that we use for ourselves. Um, and we, what we did bad is we never learned how to really market it. And if you're going to be a really good products company, you better know how to market really well. <laughs> it's in. I just, it's just, you hear about so many agencies. I know Varun said it earlier and I'm just repeating what he said, but the, you know, you've been doing, you know, stuff for other people and then you realize, oh yeah, we should be doing that for ourselves. I think one of the things that, and I'm going to go back to kind of teams and resources and growth and your anti-process. I mean, maybe not anti-process, but like your myth of process. 
how do you grow that? You know, I think, and I think you said it earlier that like, you know, developers and engineering, they, they tend to speak the same language. So it doesn't matter where they are and who they are and all of that. How have you guys been able to, as you say yes and say yes to your next project? And you, oh yeah, we can do that. Yes to your next product. Is there a secret to your growth? How have you been able to manage that? Is it in-house, outhouse? And there was a lot of questions in there. Pick yeah, one. no. And, and, <laughs> and I wish I could say it was like, there's a real clean, you know. No, but tell us your experience with it. it. You know, so, everybody's kind of gone through their own story there. We want to yeah, hear how you did no, it. No, I, I think part of it is at different thresholds of sizes, you realize you're not unique, mm. right? If you're five to seven people, you're going to have the same types of problems. You know, you get to 10 to 15, it's a different threshold. 20 to 25 is a different threshold. 30 to 40 is a different threshold. 50 and above is a different threshold, right? I haven't reached the 50 and above. We've been up, you know, to 40-ish employees and then scaled back down. Now we're about 22, 23. Like some things scale badly, right? And your leaks become you know, big holes. And, and sometimes things work really well to smaller size. And so what we're learning and what we're evolving to is, is the role of, of internal leadership and how that evolves and what does that natural organic growth look like? Um, what I believe in is, is it still has to be natural. You're still based off the people. You're, the company as a whole is a living organism. And, and I don't feel like it's really... I'm not being genuine to myself or to other people when I can sit there and go, all right, well, this process will work so that this way I should go ahead and say, you're now in charge of this and you're now in charge of that. And I'm going to relinquish that because some of what gets lost is that energy to keep driving and growing and pushing your path, your growth. And so I don't think it's unique. I don't think there's like a one way. And, I, and we see that all the time, right? It's, there's not one magic button, but I think what we've learned is, how do you enable people? What keeps people happy is they want to feel like they're contributing. And if they can come in there and they can build stuff without being watched over every second of the day, whether it's virtual or in the same room, if they feel like they're adding value, they're going to stick with you. Right. And if they feel like people are using what they're building. They'll probably want to keep building it. And, and where you start to struggle is clients. <laughs> if, if you get the right clients or not, how long you keep bad clients or not and how you handle those struggles, those become like your thresholds of how well you keep people and keep them excited and, and, and growth. I think everything else is, we've tried, you know, we've done like everything else. We have, we have a really nice office, which we're not in, but we've done lunches together. We've done snacks and food. We try and do different dinners and hangouts and those things. And when it, if it feels too, you know, forgive this term, too agency, mm. too pushed, it doesn't work well for us. If it's more like, hey, let's go get a beer after work or let's, you know, go play a game of pool or let's just, you know, see you. <laughs> you know, I'll talk yeah. to you next, next week. Like if it's more of a natural thing and what binds you is more the work that you're doing, then I think as a culture, you have a pretty stable culture. If the work is good and you're proud of it. So company culture and keeping employees happy is one thing, but then growth is still, I would keep that separate, right? I mean, Key, growth requires whole other lot of things, right? I mean, as like, so we, we heard from you that what you are doing to keep employees motivated, but what are you doing for growth? And you mentioned that, you, you, you touched on that, that it's like, you know, it should, the company should grow naturally, but yeah. is that natural growth is the product of you as an agency owner's goals right it's not going to happen by itself like it's like if you want aggressive growth then you'll work towards it if yeah. you want natural growth then it will go like that so is that what you feel what you want or well, how you, do you're going to go to your strengths right and you know for a long time in our company we don't have like the natural marketer it hasn't been in our dna but we've put out good work that's created natural referral and, and ongoing work and direction. So some of that is you can naturally exist in a certain state and be happy. The other part is, well, how do you really want to get intentional? And, and I think that begins with how do you get better as a business person? And that's a financial model. And, and we've gone the gamut where we've had like part-time, full-time financial, you know, and I would include sales in this process, figuring out that culture fit, right? Of 
How do you put together a line that represents your, your company? What's the right financial model that really represents what you can trust as a business owner? And that's hard. And I think that's where like going through the pandemic was something that's really good for us. We have a really good partner we work with who's really good at financial modeling and how we can look at stuff. So when you ask the question, well, you want to hire six employees this next six months, this is your impact. This is what it looks like. This is how much time you have to dedicate. So there is a business sense to it that you have to, I think, understand and put resources to, but there's then, all right, Jeremy or Shannon or somebody, you are responsible for that employee and letting them go through the struggle of exactly how to grow that relationship. Like, obviously I'm there to provide support and feedback, but in order for that employee or that leader in our company to be the best version of themselves, I'm not there to solve the problem for them. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm there more to, so, so can that culture exist and grow? Yeah. I think we want a bunch of people who are very autonomous in different ways. It can be very proactive, but at the same time can apply critical thinking. So we do have processes. I, I mean, I, I just know that they evolve and change and I don't put so much stock as a, founder of the company of this process is going to save us it's more of all right well let's get real specific these types of clients we know they need to get how are we going after them right and you can say ultimately that comes up with the process that can work if i hand it off to somebody but i mean you guys are doing this why because you're you're networking you're making connections with people and you're creating a pipeline for people who will want to reach out hopefully for work that you guys want to be able to relate with right so it's being out there, being proactive. And if you're passionate about one of these things and you can be proactive with it, then I think you have that much more of a chance of succeeding than somebody else. Yeah. What's one risk that you've taken as an agency owner? I'm going to change the tune here. Okay. <laughs> I know it's a hard question, but we've talked a lot about process. We've talked a lot about culture. You know, this is, it's better than asking what's the biggest mistake you made as a business, you know, as an agency well, owner. Yeah. So let's start with risk. You know, you, you know, it's, it's interesting because you, we can talk about process all day, but I, I think, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chance kind of decisions that get made in running an agency. And so I'd be curious to hear what pops into your brain and what's one that you've, you found that maybe it proved out really great. And maybe you're like, that was a risk and uh, mm, it's not something I would do it again. Um, it's, it's funny because in the, in the same way that this has been really good for us, it's also been really bad for us. Okay. And, and that is like when you are low on cash reserves, right? Cause you may have whatever money coming in different ways, but we talked cash is king, right? Be able to keep a company going. Mm -hmm. And an employee or more importantly, even your business partner comes up and says, Hey, I have this great idea. I got to build this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you look at it and you go, yep, we got to build it. And then you got to figure it out. And I, so we did that. We did that a couple different times over the years. And, and in one case, it was one of our best products that people have used and probably don't even know what we built because before we ended up launching it, it got acquired. And through that, that process. So that risk, risk became a very good thing for us because it allowed us to buy our post office billing and kind of grow our culture and do different things and, and mm -hmm. help it. So in that case, that risk paid off. And it was the same type of original to like, hey, let's go build the Tumblr app for ourselves. Like you didn't do it thinking there's gonna be a payoff. You did it because it felt right, but it was still hard to like make ends meet to pull this off, to be able to get this product out there. Um, but you need to do it. Um, we did the same thing. We started another company, um, this one called New Custom. We built really cool like coasters that you could laser etch with matte box custom prints on and, and took a bigger swing at an interesting company and we didn't market well enough and we ended up losing. So that same mentality sometimes can really pay off in swinging and, the, and then other times can, can hurt. You know, the first time it really paid off, the second time kind of hurt it kind of made us step back and be a little bit more cautious so um yeah that's probably the the base, biggest risk all right so let's flip that around and say as an agency what's your superpower 
like what are you guys like or was it we can i'll give you two options as an agency as a superpower or what is like the thing that you guys just love to build like these types of projects are your favorites when they come in the door or you're pitching them and you're like i just want that one I think we're really good at solving things that haven't been put out yet. All right. Right. And we cover a pretty interesting gamut of retail to restaurant space to whatever. So like kind of two quick examples before the pandemic um, retail, retail is a space that's very in need of, reno- of innovating. Right. So we ended up working with, with a, a guy out of Texas, uh, Matt Alexander and ended up building um, kind of the new retail experience. Right of the world that had, uh, you know, literally mapping out the store with hotspots, with a map, with an app that could scan all the prices and check out and send it to your house or the guy can come out and find you with triangulation of the beacons and all the different stuff. And he launched a store there and he actually launched a store in New York and there's three more stores or whatever that blocks. Defining that from the beginning, like what is the technologies that exist that you can make work together? What is the type of experience needs to happen? What's the app experience versus the web experience and this whole ecosystem and making it all work and then filling in the gaps and shipping it where literally people from our team are down there the day before the week it launches and installing hardware. You know, we're not a hardware company, but knowing where the gaps are and helping something launch that can do well and, and grow and have legs. So I think that, that was, kind of that superpower of we have people that can jump in, identify gaps and get over the fence. Uh, the more recent example is in the restaurant space. Um, uh, Kimball Musk, who is Elon Musk's brother, he actually owned several restaurants out in Colorado. And he reached out to us and was like, hey, I want to change. We need to change the restaurant experience. I wanted touchless ordering. It's a hot space. A lot of different companies are trying to do it a couple of different ways. This is the way I want to do it. And so listen to him, working with him and then literally building an app, you know, from the ground up, working with Olo and these other backend technologies that exist so that people could have an ability to sit down at their table, you know, scan where they are, identify who they are, make their order, pay for their order, have the food brought to them. And they have a dining experience, but not have to talk to a waiter, have any of that kind of in your face touching experience that, that people were so afraid of. Mm-hmm. and and have but yet still be able to go out and eat because the going out to eat experience is valuable and is important and so again something that we'd never done before we never done a restaurant app in that way but it was one of those things of hey let's solve this let's come together and let's make it work and you know and do it damn so first of all congratulations on working or scoring the deal with the musk family that's that must be huge. <laughs> Anyways, so you slipping that one right in there. It didn't miss. We didn't miss that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny. Like you sit there and talk about like way this technology stuff is nowadays with the pandemic, and it was one of those surreal moments where I'm having that FaceTime chat in a parking lot with Kimball, and just because that's just the way life is. It wasn't yeah. like a, you had to fly out and have a dinner with somebody anymore. It was this is my life. Let's talk and and let's be human. And so I, you know. Kimmel's a great individual and it was nice to have human conversations. Yeah. Certainly. I don't think it would have happened without the pandemic. You know, obviously it would have happened because he wouldn't have cared about the restaurant the same way. So sure. What 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 a great moment that must have been for you to, to talk so, to them. Well, I, I I think part of it is is like we've done some good stuff for different people. Um, but it's the idea of what it is. So it's not like that, oh, oh wow, it's Kimball, you know, or you know, the, the Musk family. It, it's this is a fun problem to solve. Mm-hmm. And can we help solve it? And can we build the relationship and, you know, building partnerships with people that you, you enjoy building stuff with is, is kind of the, the bigger key. Um, so like, I, I honestly wish that money and all that type of stuff would not be the conversation most of the time, you know, you want to be appreciated and you want to be able to pay for people, but you also don't want the money to be the conversation of, you know, what you're building or who you're hiring and how you like, I want to get to the stuff of let's go make something fun. You know? So that, that brings me to other, you know, uh, this confusion that is in the agency world, you know, specialist versus generalist like you, how do you put yourself? Like, are you, would you call yourself 
a specialist or a generalist? Because you you said you work across multiple industries, multiple domains, but also you work on a very specific type of projects, right? So how do you position yourself? Because this is like burning hot question right now. Like people who like every, there, there is like one camp that always talk about, you know, you have to be specialist, but then yeah. things like pandemic or recession in 2008, like all those things, you know, can make or, you know, can, can, can basically destroy you if you are just think, doing one thing. Well, so we'll go back. You, you brought Malcolm Gladwell earlier, right? And Malcolm Gladwell is famous for the taxi uh, example. Have you guys heard the, ta the taxi example? Refresh our memory real quick. Who's, who's better off? The uh, corporate office worker or the guy driving the taxi? And uh, Malcolm Gladwell goes, what's the guy who's driving the taxi? And, you know, because the guy who has a corporate office job, his life is dependent on people above him. He only has one area specific. And so that business goes down or something, he loses it. He's kind of in trouble and he kind of has those golden handcuffs. He's stuck. Taxi driver is resilient. He's fighting for his food every single day. And he has probably 10 to 15 different ways that he gets food, right? Mm -hmm. How he gets the next person, where he's going, all the different strategies. So who is more resilient? And so I think in, in growing a business, there's a lot of that same mentality. Like how do you get resilient? And when we go through this pandemic, our big clients, you know, Capital One and uh, Colonial Williamsburg and some of these big ones we've, we've been working with, they're the ones who shut down. The ones who were giving us work were all the startups, you know? And so, hey, we don't want to shut down. So we're going to work with startups. And just because the startups from a retail agency versus, a, you know, the, the food industry versus automotive and insurance or, you know, whatever, well, we don't care. Like a lot of software is you build great software. It's again, reducing friction for a good experience. And that's where like, we don't need to be the subject matter expert on the industry. We need to be the subject matter expert on what great UI is, what great coding is, what are the great ways to build, build a platform that can scale. And so we're generalists, but we're specialists in different veins, right? So we're a Python Django shop and we're very specific in that, that approach, right? We're, very specific in our front end technologies that we're using. We're very specific in our design approaches, right? But you can use those tools across multiple industries. And so we try to get too caught on the industry because we can't. We've proven for the last decade that I mean, we built an airlines company, you know, that, that was out of Dallas. Like you go from that to, you know, a product retail shop, you know, iHome, like to Tumblr, you know, to social media, like they cover such wide gamuts, but it's the same people doing the same work. And so I, I, it's hard because marketing would be easier, I think, for us in some ways of sitting there going, all right, let's own the restaurant industry and go all in. But um, I, I, don't, I don't. So like me personally, I would say that I used to be a generalist, um, but I used to always think the easiest person for me to replace, because you, know, you build a company always with the mindset of you, every job is replaceable, right? No one wants to hear that, but you have to build a company with that mindset. I thought the easiest job to replace would be mine, right? And so are you a specialist in that you can cover the ground of area of so many different places, you know, from the finance to the sales, to the business, to the strategy, to like, is that a specialty or is that a, a generalist? And, I, and I, the older I get, the more I feel like it's a specialty. And in, 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 in the middle of it, when you're younger, I feel like, you know, it's a generalist because you're covering so many different things in different ways. But I think, there's a specialty in being a generalist. And, and I think people mix those terms up a lot and, and it's, a, it's a valued skill that's important. Yeah. As an agency owner, back to you for a minute, what keeps you up at night? I think finding the next good project. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that client, that- <laughs> Welcome to be an agency owner. <laughs> that's it, I mean, what's, where's your next? It's not even so much yeah. where the next check's coming from. It's it's truly the right project keeps your people happy. Mm -hmm. And how do you find those? How do you work with those people? How do you how you feed that that group? That's honestly, I think, what what concerns me more than anything else. And I think that ties back to your previous comment about you know you being specialist, generalist. You know the way you said it because 
you are not that general that you would take any type of work because there's a reason for that, right? It's in your company's culture, like your team that works and they like to work on specific challenges, you know, that real life problems they want to solve. So acquiring those projects, and if there are going to be some ideas out there who is somebody is going to work on that can, you know, that can bring those work to you. I mean, how many such ideas, you know, come out, you know? So finding such ideas and then making sure you acquire them and keep your team busy, happy and motivated, that all makes sense that way. Well, we're, we're trying to continue to evolve. You know, uh, it's like this last year, we started putting together our own podcasts, uh, a little plug, 24 point, you know, if you want to try and find <laughs> it. But like how you communicate with people, how you connect with people to bring in the work, I think is what's important. And Sometimes it's hard. I think in our industry, a lot of us are naturally introverted and it's hard to put yourself out there and feel like someone will like you. Yeah. And when you do these types of things, there's always that element of, do they like me? And, and, and they don't want, they're going to pick me. And, you know, we lose all the time, you, you know, different bids come up, you try and go after them you try and build connections and, you know, you still lose. And so it's, it's trying to find, Again, that being able to be vulnerable, but honest and build relationships with people that, that will want to use you and, and value you. Yeah. What are your plans? What are your future plans? What are you thinking about for the future? You know, as an agency owner, outside of building new things and getting new projects that feed your soul in multiple ways. Yeah. What's that future look like for you guys? What are you thinking? It's funny because when we, when we bought the building a couple of years ago, it was kind of like, we're going to build a company to 45 to 50 people. And that's kind of the magic spot, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of target a lot of things around it. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if I have a number of like, this is how big we need to get this. Is how we're going to go after it. I think the emphasis right now is in order for this to be enjoyable and fun for the next decade, it's got to be with people that I love doing stuff with doing mm -hmm. work we like to do. And so, uh, the focus right now is again finding good partners and doing the types of work we want. I think with that, the good thing about the pandemic is we don't we could be bigger than fifty. We could be a hundred people. Like you're limited based off of the quality of work and how many people want to work for you. And and if we can evolve our culture to to accommodate for both, which I think we're trying to do, then you know, you have a chance to succeed. I, I think in the short term, it's, it's slow, deliberate growth. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of how we started out today. It's deliberate practice, you know, baby steps. If you can break things down to what your next step needs to be, then you have a more of a chance to succeed. So our next step is grow by, you know, three to five more people, get one to two really good clients that we like and go deliver for them. And then keep getting more efficient with, with our internal processes so that our margins keep increasing and we have more capital to do more with, right? Business 101. So COVID, right? This is one thing that I ask everybody. Um, how, so one, obviously it has impacted everyone, but how is it, how, how is COVID changing the way you are going to work? Are you going to stay remote? Are you going to uh, bring people back in? W what's your strategy on that? It's funny because I got asked today by one of our employees, hey, I got my vaccine. We're ready to go back to the office. Can we go back to the office? And, uh, you know, there's part of me that's like, yep, let's go back tomorrow. We're, we're ready. There's another part that's not ready quite yet, right? And what's that, that kind of feel? So um, I think we're figuring that out. I think that we're never going to be able to go back to the way it was. And that there's always going to have to be a sense of, whether it's once or twice a week, people want to come to the office, then let's be intentional about it. Uh, if you want to be in there five days a week, great. If you want to come in once every three weeks or not at all, okay. Like we can't hold that above anybody anymore. So if you want that great designer, great developer, strategist, whatever, they can be wherever they want to be. And so I, I think there's an element that you have to accommodate for those individuals, but at the same time, um, we do miss the face-to-face. And you do miss like the strategy stuff. So I'm not quite sure how we evolve it. It's going to evolve some. I mean, we used to be really good with like team, like company lunches and all that type of stuff. 
I think some of that has to come back in some fashion, whether we stay in a big office, whether we go smaller or what we do, like, I don't know yet. Like, I think we just, we try and just like web development, you iterate based off of the feedback. <laughs> well, that leads me to another question. How does that, you know, this virtual world, how does that affect hiring and bringing in talented and I use that word hesitant. I know, I'm like dated it now for you. I so. know, no, but you don't understand what I'm saying. People yeah. who fit, you know, does that open up how you hire? And we've had this conversation with a few other people. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Cause I know you guys are, you know, based off our conversation today too, culture centric and you have this beautiful office and this beautiful space and I'm hearing positive and negative, you know, how does that kind of change your mindset with bringing in the people to fit your needs? Well, we, we, just went through this process recently. We just hired a developer in, uh, a month, two months ago now, I guess. Mm. Um, and it was all done where basically I met her face to face after she was hired, <laughs> right? And took the employee picture. We, but we did do a physical meetup there um, at, at that point. Before then, it was how we're doing this, you know, how you get new work. Uh, and I And I think that this is becoming normal enough that Hey, let's just have, let's jump on the phone and let's have a conversation. So in some ways it's easier, just like vetting clients, vetting, you know, new employees, you, you have conversation and you talk to them face to face, you have the questions, you kind of go through the different challenges that you may do. And this is natural. This has to be natural. And then I Are think- Are you looking ways, local? I guess it would both. be. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's funny because we used to be like, well, let's stick to Richmond and Virginia and try and keep it that way. Yeah. No, that's not the case anymore. I mean, we, we I mean, I had an employee for like for a couple of years live in Germany. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's been an employee of ours for, for, he's like number two employee. <laughs> you know, he's been with us for 12 years. And so like we went through that and if it's the right person, it doesn't matter, right? If, if people are really good in, in their type of role, like, I don't, I don't, I mean, I like seeing them face to face, but I don't need to see you face to face. And so that's, that, that's kind of the big experiment right now. I think if people can produce, and I've always tried to, to again, judge people based off of the work they're doing, you know, and, and if, and if they're doing yeah. good work, however that is like, I'm not going to judge you. And I, and I think, I think that will become a little bit more of the new, you know, or the ongoing culture of mobile X of, Hey, just, you got to, you know, add value, get good at your craft. We'll help you try and get good at your craft, the good projects that you got to jump on. And, you know, if you have questions to jump on for the phone call, if not, then there. And if you want to come to the office, when we can go in the office, come in, we'd love to have you. If not, okay. You know, and, and I think we'll see over time how this works because in some ways I think we went through the pandemic A because everyone had to go through the pandemic, but B we did have a decade of, people being together right so you you at least had memories of sitting next to each other i think what would be interesting now is when people come back will they like sitting next to somebody else you know well they have well it's like you listen now when you're in your in your your home office does the stereo blast and you sit in your pajamas and do you do you like i mean like you're more laid back or use co-working space that's why you know co-working space is getting huge and you know as soon as we work stock IPO comes out I'm going to buy their share you know that's going to go huge (laughs) well it even goes back to the idea of new people joining who have not you know whether it's young people old people or people transitioning into a new career where you don't have the history together and being able to look at who you bring into your organization you know, going back to the conversation around talent and process, you know, process is there in some cases uh, to help onboard people. So it takes things off you as a leader's plate in some cases for some process, but even bringing in people, you said you have a fella in Germany, he was employee number two or three, you know, but employee number 37 that you're going to bring in the door. They could be anywhere in some but, cases. It's, you know, they've never been with you and they're physically here. I'm just, I'm, yeah. it's just a cultural shift. It's just interesting. Well, I think that's what's funny because we just, and we still have our Monday all hands. Everyone gets on, a, you know, the virtual chat and we kind of have like what's going on and the 
the call outs, all that type of stuff. We actually even are trying new ways of being fitness, you know, conscious as a company. One of our developers, actually our director of, of engineering wrote a quick iOS app that lets you track everything and you have like a leaderboard and, you know, direct whatever. So like, I think there's fun things that people will do to try and cover that gap. I think those who are around locally, like we'll go to the park, we'll go do different things, meet up as the world opens up more. But part of it is also, again, like not forcing it. And mm. for me, I'll feel good about an employee when they've shipped something they're proud of. I think if they never ship something they're not, that they're not proud of, you're always at risk of losing them. If they ship something they're proud of, then you, you have them. You know, and, and they want to keep doing stuff that, that, that is adding value. So I, I think that's kind of that really interesting piece to me is, is some come in. So, that, you know, just like, you know, our employee we hired, they wanted to put her through training for a little bit longer. I'm like, let's just put her on a project and let's let her go. And you, within two weeks, she's shipping code and client's happy and she's rocking. They're like, hey, she's a rock star. Let's keep going. So that's what you want. And I think people feel like they're, they're coding a value or designing something for value or you know whatever then then you get that right type of culture so so you know meaningful work doing something right away cool wow this is good chat today good chat if Rune, any other last minute questions before we wrap things up here no i think we we did we did pretty much everything we got all anything, Garrett, on your end that you'd like to shout out as we wrap things up and tell people where they can find you. Um, Last I'm just minute. curious. We were talking a little bit about this in the beginning, but what what things have been standing out the most to you all as you've been doing this series? Oh, that's a great. Like, question. what's what's the common thread, and what's the the thread of dissonance? You know, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it's a we at, we talk to a lot of people about culture and how they sustain culture, and so that's one of the interesting conversations. I don't know for me, and for I don't know if what Varun thinks too, but how established agencies are able to maintain that level of connection regardless of location, and you know, it's interesting to hear how people tackle that, overcome that, approach that not only for themselves as a leader, but how they perceive it for, you know, the rest of your, of the team, you know, you, for example, talking about, you care a lot about your people. That's very, very clear. And you want to make sure that they have opportunities and there's growth and the projects are interesting and you're doing good work. And it's important that you're not only bringing the work to the table, but it's part of like a little, like a little family. I'll use yeah. that word hesitantly, <laughs> but the right. decisions the, that you're making are based around that culture. And so it's interesting to hear how other people approach that challenge. Varun, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think uh, company culture is definitely a common thread that we have seen uh, across. But the other aspect that we have seen more is, uh, you know, the impact or, or the uh, trajectory of their business after COVID, right? This is like very, very similar approach. No one is thinking of going full-time in person anymore. Like not a single one we spoke to like mm -hmm. in 10 or 12 conversations. So um, that's, uh, that was quite interesting to me because that is changing the industry, not only from the commercial real estate or from, you know, local um, uh, community and, you know, local business. It is basically opening up the world for, for, for the agency owners to go anywhere, right? As you mentioned earlier, software is a common language, right? You don't need, uh, you know, you, you just need somebody who understand what to write, how to write code. It could be anyone or anywhere, right? So people, I think, so that, that's what we are hearing a lot from any owners too. So um, I think those two things really stick out. No, it's definitely interesting how Location does not matter. Yeah. I mean, one of our clients, even though her company is based in the U.S., she's been in Mexico for the last six months. <laughs> so sounds like, good. And why, why not? You know, and, why not? and you know, if you can be focused and work where you need to work, I think it opens it up. So I, I think part of it comes back to that demographic. You know, um, 
we used to have a lot more I guess, as of a younger group as we as I get older we get older you get more families and and, and so that's a different dynamic but but yeah I mean it's, yeah, more over what it is going to do I think what we are hearing is now because people are going remote right so they have started thinking like I'm I live in Boston the agency in Boston I was talking to they were all Boston focused. Now they have started going outside, like from metros to small remote towns in the US. From there on, they are talking about going to low cost, um, you know, com- countries like, you know, hiring people in South America, East Europe, India, Asia, you know, it has basically opened up the entire, you know, it, it has, you know, it can help Planet. them get, yeah, it can help them get higher profit margin and, and bring the cost down. I, I don't know. Right now, so this is what I'm trying to understand, talking to these agencies, like how is it impacting their pricing? Like, do, do, do they, like, we you know the standard price, everyone is at, you know, $150, $200 an hour. Now, if you are hiring talent in, you know, other countries, how will that change? Will you change? Or, you know, does that matter anymore? I mean, so, some some do agree, some not, but at least those are the questions people are thinking about, and uh, you know we are talking to. Uh, well, it's it's definitely an interesting time because you have again bigger companies are setting the trend for the smaller companies, and as soon as you know Apple and Google and all them decided, all right, yeah. it doesn't matter, you don't have to live in California anymore, exactly. right? Then you start having the picking off of the tiers below them, and and we all know as like a as a company, your sweet spot are your your mid tier employees, right? They're the ones who get the most margins. They can do a lot of the work that the seniors can do, and they're hungry, and so they actually some a lot of them work more hours, and so like that mid tier now is getting picked off more and more, and and it's harder to compete. So for us, what is the next step? You know. I never thought I would start looking at bringing in people from India and other countries and figuring that process. We're now starting to have conversations around that. And so I think there is a, a natural evolution that, again, we kind of go back to that, what's that natural piece going to be? Um, I, I have no doubt that more and more companies will follow similar to the model that you guys have, where you have real strong communicators that are handling key pieces of strategy and design directives that are growing bigger teams that, that are split across the, you know, multiple countries and proving really good value for it. So uh, one of the things I used to do, I haven't done in a while, I used to go to the uh, conferences in, in Ireland. The UL, I don't know if you ever heard of the UL, U-L-L. It, it's, it used to be like a lot of that Apple fanboy type base, you know, so Apple conferences in, in Ireland. But it was fun to go to because you got to rub shoulders with developers from Europe and Ireland and a um, couple from Brazil and South America, as well as the US. And, and that mix of just how people approach software, seeing it year over year, how, how it was just changing. And, and in some ways becoming more of the same, <laughs> right? And so as you get more of those similarities, the ability to bring in outside resources and now with the technology the where, where it is, you know, you know, I'm, I'm all for it and, and, and I'm anxious to try and figure out how to do that in different ways. Um, the funny thing is I actually am fluent in Portuguese. And so have some people from Brazil working so where I can practice my Portuguese would, just, would be kind of fun, you know? So, so there's different things you think about, but you don't really know until opportunities start to come up. And, and now I think opportunities will come up more and more just because we have to, you know, as, as companies to survive. That makes it more accessible normalizes it yeah it is it's not, it's not as you know for lack of a better term it's not as foreign as it used to be you know it's, it's one of those <laughs> hey look at that it must be wait it's only monday and we're already doing doing those. no problem well garrett thanks so much for being here we appreciate it you know the where if you're listening and you'd like to find garrett online he's available on linkedin twitter under gr tweets the mobilux website m-o-b-e-l-u-x.com um, you also have a personal website and an Instagram. So both under Garrett Ross. So and check out uh, 24 Point on YouTube or on any of your favorite podcasts. Sounds good. Get a sense there. 24 so. Point. Great. So yeah. thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks everybody for listening. Hope you learned something today. If so, tell somebody about the podcast. Varun, rock on. Nice to chat rock with on. you as always. Sounds great. 
Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.